Uh, it's um, with great pleasure that uh, I uh, am going to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Van Muirs to moderate the next session. Um, we are going to be spending the next hour and a half or so talking about uh, different aspects of uh, the diaphragm and congenital diaphragmatic hernia, arguably one of the most vexing problems that we still face collectively and uh, at the individual bedside. Uh, Dr. Van Muirs will uh, moderate this session. Dr. Van Muir been, has been here for um, a lot longer than she looks like she's been here. Uh, and um, she uh, trained at uh, DC Children's and did her fellowship there, spent uh, a meaningful percentage of time at the NIH, and really was uh, very involved in some of the uh, early uh, ECMO trials and, and really was very uh, central to the early nitric oxide trials. Uh, that uh, took place uh, when we were trying to determine how best to use nitric oxide. She's played a critical role in a number of uh, large uh, neonatal trials. Uh, she's been a, a significant presence in our nursery, both uh, as a clinician, as a, a clinical leader, and has uh, quite a prominent uh, national profile in these areas as well. So, Krista, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to moderate. Thank you for that very kind um, introduction. And um, yeah, I was very happy to see CDH be one of the focuses of this um, symposium um, because um, CDH was actually my first sort of clinical article um, following my time at NIH. And you know, it's continued to be a sort of a disorder that that has um, troubled us. You know, I think we've tried so many different modalities to try to aff affect the survival, but still really haven't. Um, found the one, the one magic bullet. Um, so today, um, we're going to have three um, very interesting um, speakers and presentations that range um, from the laboratory to, um, to the fetus and then um, to, the, to the baby. And so I want to introduce the, the first speaker, Dr. Sun, who is currently a professor of pediatrics at UCSD. Um, she got her um, PhD in developmental biology at Yale and then went on to do a postdoc in developmental genetics at UCSF. Um, she has focused broadly on lung development using d disease modeling for basic discoveries in developmental biology and stem cell biology. She's been extremely well funded after looking at her CV and ha currently has an RON from Heart, Lung, and Blood looking at CDH. So I'm very interested to hear her presentation. Dr. Sun. Thank you very much for the um, wonderful introduction. And it's great to be here and thank uh, David for the invitation to speak, and it's really an honor. Um, so um, I'm a PhD, and my lab use mouse models to study lung diseases. Um, so what I show in the uh, front slide here are two mouse hearts. Um, so you might know, uh, you might wonder, why am I showing hearts in the lung disease uh, conference? So uh, those of you who care for CDH babies would know that the heart is the direct outcome for lung um, perturbations in CDH. So in a few slides, I, show, uh, I hope to show you what this particular front, uh, front slide is about. Okay, so I'd like to start um, by uh, just introducing to you um, the general diseases that my lab models. Uh, the lung diseases are uh, a, a good variety of them. Uh, some are rare lung diseases and some are, are more common diseases such as asthma. And today I'm going to focus on, on congenital diaphragmatic hernia, CDH, and we typically use a genetic model um, in mice looking at the genes implicated in those diseases. Okay, so I don't need to introduce to many of you in the audience what CDH is about. So a typical um, presentation, just real quick slide, is that there are larger holes in the diaphragm allowing the uh, herniation of uh, abdominal organs into the chest, compressing the lung uh, in utero, leading into a small size of the lung as well as inability of the lung to um, expand at birth. It's a relatively common um, birth defect, one in 2,500 babies, and uh, often associated with pulmonary hypertension as well as other respiratory deficiencies. So my understanding by talking to clinicians is that 
the, uh, it's commonly believed that the respiratory uh, dysfunction is secondary to herniation and compression of the lung. Um, and it's always puzzling that some patients would do well after uh, diaphragm repair surgery and others would not. So um, when we got into uh, trying to model CDH, one of the questions that is in the front of our mind is to ask, is there a lung, a lung intrinsic uh, role for those CDH mutations um, that uh, function within the lung that is independent of the uh, mechanical compression of the lung leading to the respiratory distress? So um, I hope um, towards the end of the talk, uh, I will deliver some evidence from, from my lab um, that gave us lessons from the mouse models uh, in three folds. First of all, CDH mutations can have a direct impact on the lung, and, and CDH uh, respiratory defects can arise from multiple uh, distinct, very distinct mechanisms. And uh, I hope to show you some examples of the mouse model can be used to uncover these uh, distinct mechanisms as well as test some of the therapy in the preclinical pre model. Okay, so I'm going to give you two um, short stories of uh, two of the genetic bases of CDH that we modeled in mice. Uh, the first is in the gene called PBS, which encodes a transcription factor, and the second is in the gene called Robo, which encodes a transmembrane molecule. Okay, so as I mentioned, PBX encodes a transcription factor. It's a homeodomain transcription factor that is probably best known as a Hox cofactor. It binds to Hox transcription factors and increases their binding specificity as well as affinity. So a number of years ago, um, beautiful work from Pat Donahoe's group, um, with whom we collaborate now, uh, had shown that a global inactivation of PBX1, one of the PBX genes, leads to a diaphragm defect um, and uh, lethality at birth with a CDH presentation. So we got into this uh, knowing that PBX genes are expressed in the lung, in particular the lung mesenchyme, and we wanted to ask if it does have a specific role within the lung. So what we did is to use a mouse genetic approach to conditionally inactivate using uh, uh, inactivated PBX using a driver that is on what you see blue here is the trachea as well as the lung mesenchyme. And the section here, here is the lung. So it's active in the lung but not active in the diaphragm. Okay, so using this uh, TBX4 CRE in combination with uh, PBX1 to meet, uh, 1 to flux the conditional alleles, we were able to inactivate these two uh, redundantly functional PBX genes um, in the mouse lung. I don't know if I can replay this. So essentially, these two animals that don't move around, these are mutants. So these animals um, do survive birth, unlike the, uh, the global mutant. Uh, they don't have the herniation phenotype because it's not inactivated in the diaphragm, but allow us to isolate uh, the mutation into the lung. Uh, these animals um, uh, have uh, developed tachypnea, and uh, they, most of them die uh, shortly before weaning. So when we open these animals up, um, so this is one of the longest living animals. What we see is a hugely enlarged heart compared to the um, to the control. So what's shown on the right hand side, uh, on the corners here, actually the weight of the animal. So these animals are actually much smaller compared to the control, but they have uh, a much bigger heart. So as um, most of you know that uh, pulmonary hypertension um, is one of the key uh, morbidities associated with uh, CDH. Um, so when we look at these animals at earlier stages, we indeed see right ventricular, uh, over, uh, right, right ventricular um, uh, wall increase compared to the control, uh, whereas the left ventricle uh, size is, uh, sickness is pretty normal. We also looked at uh, PAAT, uh, PAET ratio as a, um, a feature of pulmonary hypertension, and that ratio is plotted on the bottom here. So um, normally there is a slight increase um, in the control animals uh, shortly, starting shortly after birth, and you can, as you can see in the mutant, um, there is a plateau as well as a slight decrease um, suggesting. So these are key features of pulmonary hypertension, and to my knowledge, 
knowledge by talking to people who model pulmonary hypertension um, in mice. Uh, this is one of the, the most severe um, pulmonary hypertension uh, mouse model that actually lead to lethality of the animals. So um, with mice, we can trace the phenotype to any stages or any cell types so we can analyze. So one of the key questions that we asked is what is the cause, uh, cellular cause for the defect? So uh, as some of you might know that it could be a result of decrease in pulmonary artery vein number, increase in vascular smooth muscle number, um, decrease in pulmonary capillary density, um, or a increase in vascular smooth muscle constriction. So we tested all these um, possibilities. Um, I won't have time to show you the data, but we basically were able to rule out the first three. Um, and uh, when we looked at the, the last possibility, what we did is uh, look at a ratio of uh, vessel circumference uh, divided by uh, smooth muscle cell number around the vasculature in the, uh, in the pul uh, in pulmonary artery. Um, and we plotted that ratio. So you can see um, in the white bars here are uh, embryonic day 18, postnatal day 3, and uh, postnatal day 7. And as expected in the normal animal, there is a relaxation of those, um, of those vascular smooth muscle cells. There is an increase in cell size. Um, and then uh, upcoming now it, with with that is the drop in uh, pulmonary resistance. In the mutants, though, um, this uh, remains flat, suggesting that these uh, vascular smooth muscle cells remain constricted. Uh, we think that is leading into the pulmonary hypertension phenotype that eventually leads to the uh, right ventricular failure and lethality of these animals. OK, so um, with that uh, um, cellular me mechanism, we then moved into molecular mechanism. So um, I mentioned that this is a transcription factor. So we did the transcriptome studies. And so what's shown here is uh, the, uh, a uh, combination of the molecular pathway that is leading into smooth muscle constriction versus smooth muscle relaxation that balance um, in, in the vasculature. So anything that is labeled in red here are the factors that are altered in uh, our transcriptome study in the PBX mutant. So suggesting to us that it's affecting many of the genes in the pathway. And we can, um, so looking at the final outcome of uh, the molecular pathway, which is phosphorylation of myosin light chain, um, when we looked at um, the uh, histology of the animals with a uh, myosin light chain phosphorylation specific antibody, you see here um, in the control, here is the airway, here's a vas, uh, uh, here's a, um, a vasculature, and uh, there is uh, some staining in surrounding in the vas in the smooth muscle surrounding both, and in the mutant we see a very um, specific increase of staining around the vasculature, but not around the airway. Okay, so. Um, so we were then inspired to go in there and uh, see if we can test off some of the drugs that are um, commonly used to treat uh, CDH babies. One, so um, as many of you might know, one of the key pathways that's targeted often is the upstream endothelium receptor pathway. So here's an example of one of the blockers that we use, BQ123. So in the control animals, we were able to find a dose that would lead to the relaxation of the smooth muscle. So this is looking at the uh, PAAT, PAET ratio as well. Um, but in the mutants using the same dose, we were not able to achieve that relaxation. Um, so we went back to the drawing board of the pathway and, um, and uh, uh, reasoned that uh, perhaps because many of the genes in the pathway are affected, uh, just affecting uh, a upstream pathway might not be able to impact many of the downstream uh, pathway genes if PBX has a direct effect uh, epistatic to the upstream regulation. So we went closer to the phosphorylation of myosin light chain by uh, using a uh, rho kinase inhibitor, ROC inhibitor. Um, so this is a, a particular small molecule called Y27632. Uh, and using that treatment, we were able to um, uh, reduce the um, phosphorylation of myosin light chain in histological sessions. And, um, 
when we looked at the uh, smooth muscle cell size, uh, we were able to not only relax the smooth muscle cells in the control, but also relax the smooth muscle cells in the mutant. And also when we uh, observe the PA, uh, PAAT, PAET ratio, that is also um, altered nicely in the mutant. So if we do the IP injection, um, we, were not, uh, we were able to achieve these uh, changes cellularly, but we were not able to, uh, to um, prevent the lethality of these animals. But um, recent work from uh, David McCauley, who had, was the, uh, a, a neonatologist who was working on this project in my lab, had carried on with the work in his own lab and had shown that intranasal introduction of this compound is able to sustain the, the life of the animal. So um, that gave us some, um, perhaps, uh, insights and hints into what might be um, doable in, in infants. Okay, so just want to summarize this part of the short story. Um, this is um, a demonstration of a diaphragm independent cause of blunt defect in CDH. And clinical implication, uh, I would venture to suggest uh, perhaps for CDH cases that are associated with those um, lung intrinsic cause of the requirement for those, uh, for those genes, uh, in addition to uh, treating repairing the diaphragm, you need to go in there and directly treat the disease. And um, for me, I'm also very excited of the biological, uh, basic biology insights, which is that PBX is one of the key transcription factors upstream and regulating multiple factors within this pathway, both um, in the constriction as well as relaxation pathway. Okay, so this work was published um, uh, last year in JCI. Okay, so let me move on to the second story, which is a gene that is a transmembrane molecule uh, called robo. Um, so in mouse as well as human, there are four robo genes, single pass transmembrane, uh, and they receive a signal from slit, which is a secreted factor. So we got into this work um, through a, comp uh, a compound mutant, Robo-1 and 2 global mutant, um, that die at uh, birth with the cyanotic phenotype. And uh, indeed, when we look at uh, the lung dissected out, both in home mount as well as in section, there is a collapsed lung. So when we bisected these animals, though, um, we uh, actually were surprised to find that there is a CDH phenotype. So, um, so this is looking at the mouse diaphragm uh, from the chest down. So there is usually a small hole that allows the uh, passing of the esophagus from the chest to the abdominal cavity. So in the mutant, so the, here's an example um, of a stomach um, in the chest cavity, as well as if you look at the dissected diaphragm, that larger holes compared to the control. So we continued working on this um, because uh, deletions in chromosome regions spanning the robo-1 and 2, uh, so these two genes are linked very closely in mouse as well as human genomes, um, as well as point mutation in robo-1 has been reported in human CDH patients. So um, we also were interested in this aspect of lung-specific defect. Um, so what we did is to then conditionally inactivate robo um, using a driver that is active in the lung uh, epithelial cells. So in this animal, the diaphragm is bypassed. There is no longer defect in the uh, diaphragm. The animals do live, um, but when we section the alveolar region of the animal, there is simplification. So to address what um, is leading into this simplification, what we did first is the transcriptome study, just taking the whole lung. And we were very surprised to find that of the top change genes, many of them are immune regulators, and uh, some of them are increased very many folds. So to follow this up, what we saw um, by cell staining is that uh, there are increased immune cells within the lung. So uh, here's an example of ISOP4, which is a marker for macrophages within the lung. So we were then interested in uh, dissecting out this bonicular pathway uh, to address well, how is robo um, function within the lung regulating immune response at baseline. So these are just um, uh, mouse uh, facility raised animals that were not challenged with anything. And is this immune response linked to the simplification that we see? 
Okay, so first of all, we wanted to ask where is Robo expressed within the LAN? So using a knocking Alexi allele, um, what we were able to find is along the airway, they're actually expressed in very discrete small clusters of cells that you'll hear more about cr from Kristen this afternoon um, that are, are pulmonary neuroendocrine cells. Um, here, so here's a marker of CGRP, which is a neuropeptide that it makes. Okay, so um, how would robo function within the PNECs uh, to drive that function? So before I tell you about that, let me give you a quick background of, of PNECs. Um, not a ton are known about these cells, partly because um, they're quite rare cells. Um, they're less than 1% of the cells in the lung, and um, they oftentimes uh, form uh, clusters of 5 to 20 cells, um, that are enriched at branch point junctions and they're innervated by neurons. And even though they're epithelial cells, uh, they have a lot of neuronal characteristics. They make dense core vesicles that are filled with um, uh, neurotransmitters and amines and, uh, and neuropeptides. Okay, um, so a, a big bulk of the literature on PNECs are actually on pathology. So um, Gail Deutsch is one of the leading people um, who study PNECs in human uh, lung diseases, and there is increase in PNECs and their associated peptides in many uh, lung diseases, including rare diseases like CDH and knee-high, as well as more common diseases, uh, for example, COPD, and we recently showed um, in collaboration with um, with uh, Gail on um, that there is increase in asthma as well. Okay, so robo, I want to circle back. Uh, robo uh, genes are expressing PNECs. Um, is there a PNEC defect in that particular mutant? So this is uh, looking at PNEC uh, by a synaptophysing gene expression staining, um, looking at both cell bodies uh, with these uh, arrowheads here, as well as nerves that innervate these cells. So in the mutant, when we looked at early stage embryonic day 13.5, when these cells are first specified, um, we actually see pretty normal number um, as uh, compared to the control. Um, but two days later, um, we see a defect in the mutant. So normally, um, these uh, cells will start to cluster into those uh, neuroepithelial bodies. And in the mutant, they don't cluster. So they remain solitary. And that continues on into postnatal stage. And it's a very high, highly penetrant phenotype in this particular mutant. So this suggests to us that robo is important for this formation of uh, NEB. And the next question we asked is, um, how is it or is it linked to this immune response? So to address that, I, I come back to that feature of PNEC, which is that they, they produce a lot of neural peptides. So we looked at um, the uh, production of uh, gene expression of neural peptides um, by looking at uh, QRT analysis of several of the key neuropeptides that are made by PNECs. As uh, you can see here, uh, several of the members, so I think five out of ten um, that we, five out of nine that we assayed, uh, are increased in the mutant compared to the control. So the next question we asked is whether these increases are linking to the immune response because some of the, those neuropeptides in the literature have um, been able to show, uh, have the ability to call in neuroendocrine cells sorry, calling immune cells. So what we did is to gen genetically introduce some of those uh, neuropeptide uh, gene mutations into our robo mutant background and ask if there is an effect. So for example, CGRP, which is one of the key neuropeptide genes that we found increased, when we introduced into the robo mutant background, so, uh, and this is looking at the immune cells in those uh, different genotypes, so uh, robo, uh, robo control on the left here, robo mutant, and then top with CGRP wild type, and bottom the CGRP mutant. And the quantification of those immune cells is shown on the right hand side here. So you can see here in the right quadrant, where we in, in, inactivated CGRP in the robo mutant background, we were able to attenuate that immune response, um, immune cell infiltration in the lung. So, um, and this is, uh, suggests to us that this increase in your endocrine cells might be contributing to this uh, immune cell increase in the mutant. I also wanted to point out that it doesn't really go back down to all the way down to baseline, so there's um, uh, likely other factors that are involved. 
Okay, so this allows us to put uh, along this path that robo function in uh, clustering those in your endocrine cells, and when these cells are not clustered, they become uh, in some ways hyperactive, produce more of the product, and this product, increasing this pre nc product, is linking, linked to this immune cell response. So the next question we wanted to ask is, is this immune cell response linked to the um, alveolar simplification, or is that uh, quite not uh, linked uh, to, to this, the immune cells, perhaps more in, uh, directly from other aspects of the robot function? So um, the experiment that we did here is to uh, use collagenate, one of the macrophage depleting factors to treat this mutant. Uh, so this slide is to show you that we were able to find the dose and that with collagenate treatment in the mutant, we were able to uh, drop the uh, uh, macrophage number back down to the baseline. So if we would do that in the animal before the uh, uh, arrival of the alveolar simplification phenotype, we were able to very nicely prevent that simplification, and that's quantified on the right here. Okay. So um, that's um, all the data that I'm going to show you on this uh, second model. And I hope um, this demonstrates a second uh, diaphragm independent cause of lung defect. And in this particular model, it's uh, through PNEC malformation and uh, changing neuropeptide uh, level and leading into lung inflammation, which then leads to these immune cells. We, we, have, uh, we have some data suggesting that it's likely working on the extracellular matrix of these animals. Uh, so similar to a, a case of COPD, but this is happening um, in in vivo in animals that are mutate, uh, mutation, uh, with mutation, but not treated by environmental inputs. Okay, so uh, um, it suggests uh, possible clinical inputs uh, where if we can treat um, at the level of the secreted neuropeptides or at the level of uh, changes in immune cells, and if we do that before uh, the, uh, the defect of the structure, we might be able to prevent the change of lung structures uh, that would be lifelong. And the novel biology um, suggests that the PNECs, even though they're very rare, um, they uh, might be uh, acting as the sensors of the airway wall that uh, might sense input as well as uh, producing outcomes that would have large impacts. And this is something that we've carried on study um, in my lab, and, and uh, we've recently published the study that suggests that these PNEC cells are absolutely important for sensing allergen and plays a, a very big role in asthma responses. Okay, so I want to circle back to my uh, first slide, uh, which I hope to deliver you to, to you some examples of CDH mutations can have direct impacts within the lung, as well as um, these two examples I gave you are very different mechanisms causing some of the features of CDH, and then the mouse models can be used very effectively uh, in addressing um, the mechanisms and test possible therapy. So what we're doing right now is uh, we uh, formed a very strong and productive collaboration with uh, Wendy Chun's groups as well as Pat Donahoe's groups. Both groups have um, gone on and do, uh, did a, a, high, a large number of trail sequencing. So now we have a, a big list of um, CDH um, uh, uh, genes that are candidate genes that were testing mouse models. So we're very excited about those that work. And I'd like to thank uh, people in my lab who did the work. So David McCauley, I mentioned, is a neonatologist who stayed um, in Madison, when I, um, Madison, Wisconsin, when I moved away from there. And he is um, taking uh, several of those genes, including PBX, into his own lab. And he's recently got his um, own R01, which I'm very, very excited about. And Kelsey Branchfield is a former student who did the work on Robo. Very grateful for my collaborators. Um, so Liche Salari gave us the mice for the PBX uh, study. So Le Ma and Mark Tussier Levine, um, who is here, um, gave us the animals um, uh, of uh, Robo uh, years ago for our study on that uh, model. And I mentioned our collaboration with Wendy and Pat Donahoe. Um, and very, very grateful for my funding. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions for Dr. Sack? Th 
think there were some very interesting, you know, findings that have potential, you know, avenues for hopefully for our babies with CDH yeah, in no, the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear. Um, yeah. So one thing I want. Um, I missed, um, so we looked for the NO pathway and there was no yeah. change in the NO pathway. Yeah, yeah. so endothelia, no, and then NO also. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Lovely work. A um, few questions. Uh, in the case with the clotting treatment, you guys did it, there's a decrease in alveolar simplification, which is very nice. Yeah. Um, did the pups also survive to adulthood? Were you able to kind of? Yeah, they did. So the, actually, so that model, they didn't uh, die. Um, so if we just. Oh, yeah. Act, Oh, sorry. Um, so um, in that robomutant, the conditional robomutant where we bypass the diaphragm defect, those animals actually did live. Um, so they, unlike the PBX mutant, though they, they did live. They're, they're sickly, but they did live. I see. Yeah. Um, one real quick question. Yeah. Um, um, regarding the neuroendocrine kind of uh, phenomenons you were showing, um, with the decrease of clustering of the neuroendocrine cells, I'm curious how the innervation pattern changed. Were there yeah. no more innervations? Was there perhaps even more innervation as a result of having more singletons? Yeah, really good question. So we have um, looked at just very coarsely. So the, they're still innervated, um, and, um, but we haven't gone in there and really um, very closely look at whether the, you know, the EM level architecture, whether that changed or not. But that's something that needs to be looked at. Thank you. That's an excellent talk. I learned a lot. I I saw at the beginning with all the genes you saw us changing. I also saw the cytochrome P450s uh, were affected. That that pathway. Do yeah. you know which ones? Uh, yeah. So um, so very well noticed. Um, so it turns so. Um, People in the audience might know, so cytochrome P450 is um, uh, expressed in actually in a lot of the club cells. Um, Correct. And um, so these um, PNECs are actually um, a uh, stem cell progenitors for cytochrome P450 cell population. So when we change, we think that's a secondary mm. effect of. of changing the PNECs affecting the cytochrome P450 pathway. I need to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> I've been studying that for 20 years. <laughs> Thank you. Got it. 